I had been working seasonally at Grand Teton National Park for about three years when what I'm about to tell you happened to me. I was working at Jenny Lake Campground, and this was during the summer of 95. The campground is usually pretty slow in mid to late August, given that kids are heading back to school. So I decided to go hiking on one of my days off. On this particular day, I decided to hike the Phelps Lake Loop Trail just south of Jenny Lake. It was a nice day with some clouds, but no rain or any other poor conditions in the forecast. I got to the trailhead about 10.30 in the morning and started hiking up through forested areas until I reached an area where there are several trails that branch out from the main, all leading to the lake. I took a left onto one of the smaller trails that I knew would eventually lead me back to the main trail. I had hiked about a mile and a half when I noticed that it was starting to get cloudy and windy. I thought to myself that that was strange because there had been no call for that in the forecast. The wind was coming down off the mountain, but I just pushed on with my hike. After hiking a bit further, I stopped to take a few minutes to enjoy the view before I started back down the trail I had come up. And it was about this time that I noticed something moving in the trees to my left, about 30 yards away. At first, I thought it might be a moose or an elk, since those are plentiful in the area. As I watched to see what it was, whatever it was moved from tree to tree, and then closer to me until it came out into an open area where I could see it. When I first got a good look at it, it looked like something from National Geographic magazine, like an animal you would see in a country far away and not in what's essentially your own backyard. This thing was about eight feet tall, covered in reddish brown hair, and it had a long snout with tusk-like teeth protruding from it in a way that made me think of a warthog. The eyes were dark, and the ears were small and pointed straight up. And then, in between the ears were horns that looked to be about 8 to 10 inches long. I thought to myself that maybe this was some kind of a rare mountain goat, or something like that. As I stood there watching it for several minutes, trying to figure out what it was, trying to figure out if something like this even exists, even if it was really out of place here in Wyoming, it started walking towards me at this strange sideways angle, almost seemingly so as not to expose its full body to me. Now that was strange in and of itself to see it walking like that. And then when it got within about 15 yards of me, I noticed that the front legs looked more like human arms than anything else. And it was walking on them, sort of like an ape would. And so now my brain was really trying to process understanding an animal that looked part mountain goat. Part eight. Needless to say, I was starting to get quite scared at this point because I had no idea what it was, and it kept inching closer. And then when it was within about 10 yards of me, I noticed that the horns were actually quite pointed on the tips, and the creature was starting to hold its head down in a way that the sharp tips were pointing right at me. At this point, I thought for sure that this must be some sort of a rare breed of mountain animal or something like that, since there's no such thing that should exist like this. As it came even closer to me, now maybe five yards away, I could see the eyes much more clearly as it would be periodically looking up at me, presumably to get its sight set on me. And they almost looked human-like, except for the fact that they were large and lifeless, black as coal in color. The face also now looked somewhat human-like, but still very ape-like. The mouth was open, and I could see the tusk-like teeth again. It also had a strange odor that reminded me of a wet dog mixed with something else that I can't even describe. I thought to myself, if this thing attacks me, I'm dead. And just then it proceeded to do something that scared me even more than when it was coming at me with its horns pointed at me. It held its head upwards towards the sky, and it started making a sound that sounded like a cross between a human scream and an ape's howl. At this point, I turned around and I ran as fast as I could back down the trail towards the main junction. I didn't look back until after I ran about a half mile down the trail, away from where I had originally encountered the thing. When I finally did look back, there was nothing to be seen. All was quiet and normal. So I continued hiking down the trail, which was about another mile and a half until I reached my car. I didn't tell anybody about this encounter when it happened, not family, not co-workers, 
My co-workers especially would be skeptical since they all knew that no such animal existed in those mountains, at least according to most people who live around there or work at the park. So I just kept my head down and I continued doing my job. I even continued doing that job every summer until I was in my late 20s and I finally settled down and got married. I was eventually able to push the experience to the back of my mind and only think about it as if it was some movie that I had watched or story that I had read. But then, a few years later when the internet got more popular and after listening to some stories on your channel, I realized that I may never know exactly what I saw. It doesn't seem to fit any exact description I've heard from anybody else. But I do know that it wasn't a mountain goat or any other animal native to those mountains. It was something else entirely. I was living in the mountains of Colorado in 2018 and working a second job on the night shift at a local restaurant to make ends meet. I had definitely underestimated how much money it would take to live out here, and I had completely used up my savings to get here, so leaving wasn't an option. Anyway, it was the end of my shift and I was carrying some garbage back to the dumpster on the way out to my car. I was stupidly trying to put in my earbuds while also carrying the bag of garbage, which distracted me, since I was fumbling with both. So I didn't notice at first the strange sound that I was hearing. But as I got closer to the dumpster, I heard something again, and it was louder this time, which piqued my interest. It was definitely a strange noise. It sounded like somebody was whimpering, and the noise was sort of echoing, which is when I realized that it was coming from inside the dumpster. It sort of had this human quality to it, although not exactly. I almost thought for a minute that I was going to open the dumpster to find a homeless person in there, which I've honestly heard stories like that before. They live there when the weather gets bad in order to have a bit of protection. So I slowly slid open the door a bit and peeked inside to see something huddled up, way over in the corner. I couldn't see it too clearly because it was dark in there, but it was definitely moving, definitely alive. As my eyes adjusted, I could see that whatever it was was curled up in a ball, wearing a winter coat, and its eyes were closed, or maybe just covered. But either way, after watching it for a few minutes, I realized that the coat this person had on was actually fur. I didn't know how long, but it must have been in there for days because it reeked of garbage and dirt. At first I was scared and I jumped back, but then I realized that this thing could be injured because why else would it be in there and curled into a ball in the corner? I slowly stepped back up to the dumpster and carefully looked inside again, not knowing what it would do or how it would react. But as soon as I was close enough this time, the creature opened its eyes and looked straight at me. It had the most intense golden brown eyes that I've ever seen. And then before I knew it, it lunged for me, right towards my throat. It moved to me like it was moving at warp speed. To this day, I don't know how it moved so quickly. I screamed and I threw the garbage bag at it, which caused it to back off momentarily. But then it came right back at me again, snarling and snapping its teeth. And that's when it dawned on me that this thing was not anything normal, and it might actually be a werewolf. I quickly grabbed the dumpster lid, slammed it shut on its head, trapping it inside again. It started pounding and scratching at the lid, but I held it shut and I clicked the lock. The whole time I was screaming for help, but nobody came. My co-workers later said that they never heard a thing. Eventually, it quieted down, it stopped pounding and scratching, and everything went silent, which is when I started to calm down a bit too. But I could still hear it whimpering softly from inside the dumpster. I have to admit that it made my heart break a little bit listening to it in there. So I don't know what possessed me, but then I decided to take the lid off the dumpster to see if I could now help it in some way. When I did that, it just looked at me with those same intense eyes. It didn't attack me this time though, so I slowly moved my hands and my arms, trying to motion for it to come out. I decided then and there that I wasn't going to leave this thing trapped in the dumpster. I would find a way to help it get out. So I stepped back and I slowly walked myself over to my car. I then sat inside my car waiting and watching, and eventually this werewolf thing emerged from the dumpster. It climbed up and out and limped towards my car. It didn't attack, 
It just walked calmly until it stopped next to my car. The stench was overwhelming and the thing looked like it had been in a fight or something. I could even see what looked like dried, matted blood on parts of its fur. To me, it looked like its eyes were wild with fear, but as soon as it locked its eyes with mine, it seemed to relax. It must have known I wasn't going to hurt it, and I then watched as it walked off slowly and deliberately, almost looking like it was in pain. I continued to feel bad for it, but I couldn't work out my feelings or why I would even care. I just kept wondering why I cared about a strange creature that isn't even supposed to exist and could possibly be super dangerous. I just sat there in my car for a few minutes after it walked away, processing what had happened. I couldn't believe that I had just found and helped a werewolf. I mean, who knows what could have happened to it if I hadn't been the one who found it. I'm not sure where it went after it left my car, but I like to think that it found some help and is now maybe living a peaceful life somewhere. Although, part of me wonders if it will come back one day. I can tell you that although I still work at that restaurant, I no longer volunteer to take out the garbage at the end of my shift. I live near Columbus, Ohio. However, the place I'm describing and where this happened is down in southeastern Ohio, in an area where the Muskingum River and Route 60 are close to each other sort of north of Marietta. I was listening to one of your stories about a skinwalker, and it made me think of something that happened to me a while back. I can't remember the year, but it was about 10 years ago, during the summer, when I was working for the state. I was sent to the area to work on the road as part of a road crew. I was just the flag person, and I remember it being hot as heck standing out there in the broiling sun. So one night, I was finishing up for the day and cleaning up so we could all get home. The others had already hopped in the vehicles and I spotted a few beer cans along the side of the road. So I walked over to pick them up and threw them into the truck so that I could get them out of the area. I had just finished doing that and was standing beside the truck and thinking about what I was going to have to eat when I got home when I saw something come out of the woods across the highway. It was something that looked like a man. I say that because it looked well, sort of human. It was walking across the road far behind all of our vehicles, but it didn't exactly hold its body like a human would. It was too far away to see clearly, but it had no fur or feathers. Its frame basically did look like a naked human with pale gray skin and a head that was too big for the frame. As I looked at it, it seemed to be headed towards us for a second, but then it veered off to the left when it saw me looking and it went down the embankment towards the river. The strangest thing about this whole thing is that I realized at that point that I hadn't seen anything else around that day. No other movement from animals. There wasn't anything moving, no animals, no birds, nothing. I had seen a fox much earlier in the day, but that was it. I remember it was a very strange feeling to realize that the area seemed so desolate and empty but I knew for sure that I had seen the thing that came out of the woods, but I couldn't figure out what it was. It was just made up of skin, literally, that pale gray skin. I started to think that I was just tired from the day, but it did seem very real. Again, I thought it was maybe a person, but I couldn't get past how it didn't move like a person, more like a monkey or even a big cat. And it also seemed to be gliding at an angle when it turned around and went down the embankment into the creek, sort of like it wasn't even touching the ground. I eventually just shook my head and got into the vehicle and I rode back to the station with the rest of the crew, but I never said anything to them about it. I just sat there thinking. But the next day at work, I did ask if anybody else had seen anything strange or feel like something about the day had been weird. No one had. So at that point, I decided to just forget about it, which I did, but only for one year. The following spring, when I came back to work again for the summer, there were two things that I learned that had happened that were significant, things that caught my attention. The first thing was that there had been a dead deer in the exact spot where I had seen the weird creature thing the summer before. Now, mind you, I still hadn't shared what I saw with anyone, so I was the only person aware of this weird coincidence. Now I know a dead deer on the side of the road isn't unusual, but what was strange is that when the game commission collected it, they shared with us, off the record, 
that it had been strangled, not hit by a car. They told us so that we would take extra precaution while out there. They said that they could tell by something about the way its neck was turned. Now, I don't know if that human-like creature thing I saw had anything to do with it, but I sure can tell you that my memory of seeing it came rushing back like it was yesterday. So then the second thing that was significant that I learned is really disturbing. It was that a couple of local kids had gone missing. They were teenagers, and they had disappeared from their homes. Their parents had found their beds made in the morning, but no one had seen them leave the house. Eventually, the kids were found a few days later, but they were found huddled down in that same area off the side of the road where I had seen the creature and where they found the strangled deer. When the kids were found, they were disoriented and very dehydrated. They didn't seem to know where they were, and they were mumbling things about being taken from their houses and placed there. But that's all I ever heard about the details of that. I didn't actively follow up on that story. I was just glad they were found. So over the years, I've tried to find out what it was that I had seen. I just couldn't keep it inside. I've asked a lot of people at this point if they had ever seen anything like what I described, but no one seems to know what it was. It certainly was one of the strangest things I've ever seen. I've always thought that it was possible that when I saw it the first time, it was looking for a place to bring people, like the way the kids disappeared. I'm sure that sounds crazy, but I can't explain it any other way. And my mind keeps connecting the creature that I saw with those kids and with the dead deer. But I don't know why. I've read up on it a lot, done research online. And I'm thinking that maybe it was a skinwalker. Or maybe someone else can explain to me this whole thing. Either way, I've never seen anything like it since. I've never put any of this in writing before, and I hope it makes some sense to you. But I like your stories, so I thought that I'd give you a shot at helping me with this. Just in case you come across any information that you can tie into this all. Thank you for your time. It was the summer of 2019, and a storm came through just a few days before we were set to arrive at our campsite in Talbot County, Maryland. We were heading out for a long weekend and expecting four or five of our friends to join us. We were worried about the conditions of the site after the rain, but on a positive note, the rain had brought relief from a heat wave that had been going on for weeks. The forecast now called for a cooler but clear weekend, so we decided to go camping anyway, despite a possible mess. So on Friday night, we headed out, but we were talking so much on the way there that we arrived after dark because we missed the turnoff for the campground. Luckily, there was a full moon that night and you could see the outlines of the trees. I remember thinking that this might not be such a bad place to camp, even if there is a bit of mud. We set up our tents, got some food cooking over an open flame pit, and we settled in to enjoy, hopefully without rain. The hours passed with nothing but conversation to fill them until someone pointed out how noisy the woods were becoming. My ears perked up immediately at the sounds of birds chirping insects buzzing, and other creatures doing who knows what in the night. I've spent plenty of time camping and on trails, but this was a first for this time of day. We were all starting to get tired at this point, and most of us began to drift off. I remember hearing one of my friends try to stifle his own yawns as he said goodnight. At least two others responded with their own goodnights, and we all decided it was time for bed. We rolled out mats and sleeping bags and settled in. I couldn't tell you exactly when it all happened because I fell asleep before everybody else. But somebody must have said something because I remember hearing somebody talking and then another person shushed them to be quiet. As I continued to drift in and out of sleep, I heard my friends up at the campfire calling for me. It definitely sounded like something bad had happened, so I jumped up from my tent and ran towards the sound of their voices. When I arrived, they told me they were sure something was lurking around our campsite. They had heard rustling in the bushes, but it wasn't until they saw a set of yellow eyes peering back at them that they got really scared. They all agreed to stay near the campfire and huddled around it so that whatever was out there would know we were a group. I sat with my friends for over an hour as we tried to keep each other awake watching for this thing, whatever it was. At some point, somebody mentioned that it might have left since we hadn't seen it again. If 
but I think everybody just assumed it had gone back into the woods, but might be coming back. At any rate, we didn't want to take the chance of letting ourselves get too relaxed, and we decided to take shifts, sitting out and keeping watch. Just after agreeing to that plan, the next thing to happen was the scariest minutes of my life. Off to our right was a loud growl, and the ground rumbled below our feet. Before we could scream or do anything, this creature with yellow eyes came rushing at us with a speed that we didn't even see coming. It was so fast, and my memory was so blurry, but this creature looked to me instantly like a dog man with black fur and glowing eyes. It was on top of us before we knew what was happening, and it just kept going from one to the next, swiping its claws at us and stamping its feet. It worked its way around our group, charging at each and every one of us, although it never actually touched anybody. Each of us have different memories of that night, but I remember that all my head could focus on was the way this thing moved. It's like when you watch one of those dog agility courses and you watch how they weave in and out without ever bumping into each other. This creature moved like that, swift and stealthily, and only by standing on its back legs. It basically used its arms and its hands like a human or an ape would. I remember thinking that this was definitely a dog man, and it had to be at least seven feet tall standing on its hind legs. Its yellow eyes burned through me even when it was looking elsewhere. Combine all of this with a growl so loud that I couldn't think clearly. The creature had finished its attack on everybody and then began walking towards me, with its head down like a bull ready to charge at anybody foolish enough to stand in front of it. But just then he stopped dead in his tracks and lifted his head up, as if sniffing the air. And then he looked over his shoulder and turned around to run back into the woods. I've never seen anything move that fast or jump that high before. The strangest part was how quiet it was when it ran off. There weren't any footsteps like you would expect from something that heavy running through the middle of the forest at night and it made no sounds at all except for its breathing, which was more dog-like than human-like at this point, but it still had an edge to it even if it didn't sound angry anymore. We then all sat there shaking and unable to talk at first, and then one of us, I don't remember who said it first, said they had heard the creature speaking in their heads. They said it was really strange, like they could understand its thoughts, but it wasn't English. They couldn't even put it into words. Others of us had the same experience, but some of us didn't. It's crazy how we each experienced it differently. Either way, we were all now terrified. Those of us who were able to function packed up our stuff, and then we all got out of there. For whatever reason, we all came to the conclusion that the creature just wanted us to leave his land, but it didn't want to hurt us. I wonder if we were too close to its lair, or maybe we had just surprised it. I guess we'll never know. Thank God, though, that nothing bad happened to any of us, but during the encounter, it was nothing short of terrifying. We honestly had no idea if we would live or die, and that is not a feeling that goes away easily. It wasn't until the next day that we heard rumors about dogman sightings in the area and realized that that's what had come at us. Knowing that others had also had the encounter gave us the confidence to reach out about what had happened. We tried to file a report with the police, but they dismissed our concern and told us to head back home and get some sleep. They said it was probably just a bear. None of us believe that it was just a bear. We all now know dogmen are real, and they exist in this area. I was way too shaken up to even think about going camping for a few months, but now I'm back at it. I know, call me crazy, but somehow I feel that I'm more prepared in that now I know what's likely to happen if I ever see one again. Most of my friends haven't been out again. I'm not sure if they'll ever be able to camp again, but we'll see. I became a zookeeper for a weird reason. When the unavoidable why comes up over dinner or something, I wish I could say that it was the first stop on my journey to becoming a vet or a conservationist. Instead, I say it's because of a dream I had. One night when I was really young, I dreamed that a strange animal came and knocked on my window. It looked like a dog with the face of a man. I didn't recognize the creature, 
and I never knew what it was called, but I did feel at that moment that I knew that creature. It felt like that animal and I belonged together. Weird, right? Anyway, that's why I became a zookeeper. There's something that calls me to the side of animals and wildlife. I feel at home next to them. Working at the zoo was much cheaper than vet school, too. Usually when I tell that story, whoever's listening asks me if I'm waiting for that weird animal to come back. The answer, of course, is no. I know that it was a dream. But that doesn't mean that I haven't seen strange things on the job. I work in New Mexico, and our zoo is closed on federal holidays. But we're still there to tend to the animals, of course. On one such holiday, I was part of a small crew making sure the animals received all the food, water, and medicine they needed. All was going well, until the afternoon. It was still midday when I saw it, which makes it worse, don't you think? Because I got to see it in the light of day with all of its unnatural details. There was this cry from the bird cages. It was a panic, an entire orchestra of frightened birds. I was the nearest to that part of the zoo and naturally arrived there first. I expected to see a fight breaking out within the exhibits, but instead, it was the thing that was outside the cages that had all the birds rattled. The thing was perched on all fours in the posture of a dog or a wolf. I thought for a second that one of our canines might have escaped their enclosure, but the bright light of the afternoon kept me from making that mistake. This thing was almost entirely hairless, except for wiry patches around its shoulders and hind legs. Instead of hair, a single row of pointed spines sprouted up from its back. My footsteps drew its eyes from the birds to me. Its snout was long, still canine, but several of its teeth protruded from its lips. Its face seemed to be locked in a permanent snarl, and it glared at me with eyes that shined red in the sun. I took a step back. What else could I do? I didn't feel friendship radiating from this thing. I didn't feel secure. What I felt was very threatened. I found myself wishing that I was inside the bird enclosures. Maybe I would be yelling and squawking like them, but at least there would be something between this creature and myself. The animal's long claws scraped the gravel path as it shifted its entire body toward me. The spines on its back seemed to shake, as if it was scanning the air in order to predict my next movement. The spines on its back seemed to shake, as if it was scanning the air in order to predict my next movement. It predicted right. When I ran, I heard it scurry on the sidewalk behind me. I imagined those claws that were on the stone, tearing through my skin instead of through the dirt. I imagined those teeth sinking through my clothes and becoming lodged in my body. I couldn't let that happen. I yelled for help, hoping that with a few more people on the scene, the creature might turn and run. I was lucky that somebody else was nearby. I ran into the arms of a fellow zookeeper who immediately began asking what happened, what I was running from. I couldn't believe that they didn't see it, but sure enough, when I turned around, the beast was gone. We inspected around the bird cage, though, and did find evidence of its presence. There were faint tracks on the path, small markings where the animal's claws had scratched the ground. They were easily dismissed, but I knew what they were. When we tried to report the incident, I was surprised that animal control didn't arrive at the zoo alone. They were accompanied by the state police. Maybe the weird canine was a wanted felon. I don't know. I do know that their questions were strange and that none of them acted like they believed me. In fact, I was basically dismissed even before my story began. We understand you think you saw something, was what they said. I had given a vivid description and showed them the marks on the ground, but it was all for nothing. It was like they had just come to the zoo just to inspire some sort of doubt in my head. They wanted me to think I dreamed it, even though I knew the difference, and it was irrefutable. I'm not trying to inspire any conspiracies here, but it didn't sound like this was their first rodeo. It seemed like they had been here before. When I tried to refute all the arrogance that they were throwing at me, they threatened to arrest me. They claimed I was disturbing the peace. I think they were just throwing their weight around. 
Eventually they left, and the creature never returned. That's lucky for us, I guess. Lucky for me, especially, because I wouldn't want to quit my job there. I love the animals, and animals still feel like home to me. Even if the creatures that come knocking on my window in my dreams are now a lot more terrifying than they are friendly. I wanted to share a story with you that's been on my mind for quite some time. It's a story about my grandmother and her belief that my youngest cousin, Alex, was once possessed by a demon. Her conviction is so strong to this day that it's hard not to believe her. My aunt and uncle died in a car wreck when Alex was two, so he lived with my grandmother until he went off to college. I always attributed Alex's behavioral problems to him losing his parents at such an early age. But my grandmother swears up and down that he had to be possessed by a powerful demon. Luckily, he has since beaten all the odds and has turned out to be a great young man. But he was quite a handful growing up. My grandmother lives in a small town in the countryside. She's always been a devout Catholic and has always believed in the existence of demons and other supernatural entities. Her belief was strengthened after an incident that occurred with Alex when he was only six. My grandmother was the one who noticed that something was wrong with him. He was always a happy and energetic child, but suddenly he became withdrawn and would often talk to himself in a strange voice. My grandmother was convinced that he was possessed by a demon and did everything in her power to help. It started with Alex having nightmares every night. He would wake up screaming and my grandmother would comfort him. But then, things started to get worse. One day, my grandmother found him talking to himself in a strange voice, and he didn't seem to recognize her. She tried to talk to him, but he wouldn't respond. My grandmother took Alex to the priest in their church, hoping that he would be able to perform an exorcism. But the priest was skeptical and told her that there was nothing he could do. My grandmother refused to give up. She continued to search for help. One night, my grandmother woke up to the sound of Alex screaming. She rushed to his room to find him writhing in his bed. His eyes were closed, but he was speaking in a language that she couldn't understand. She called for help, and they managed to calm him down. My grandmother sought help from different people, including healers, priests, and even some paranormal investigators. Some of them dismissed her claims, while others offered to help, but they were unsuccessful in their attempts. As time passed, Alex's behavior became more erratic. He would throw things and speak in tongues, and my grandmother was convinced that he was possessed. She tried to keep him close and even stopped going to work to take care of him. She was terrified that Alex would even hurt himself or somebody else. She was also worried that the demon would never leave him and that he would be lost forever. One day, my grandma was out buying groceries. Alex started to scream again. This time, he began to throw things around the room, including his own body. My grandmother came home to find him covered in bruises and scratches. She was desperate for answers and went to see a renowned exorcist who lived in a nearby city. She begged him to help her grandson, and he agreed to perform an exorcism. The exorcism was a long and grueling process, but finally, it seemed, the demon left Alex's body. My grandmother was overjoyed, but she couldn't shake off the feeling that the experience had changed Alex forever. The exorcist told my grandmother that the demon was attracted to Alex because he was a vulnerable child. The exorcist also revealed that the demon had been feeding off of Alex's negative emotions, causing him to become more erratic and aggressive. He cautioned my grandmother to be watchful of Alex's behavior because demons can return. After the exorcism, Grandma noticed a marked improvement in Alex's behavior. He was no longer speaking in tongues or throwing things around. My grandma was convinced that the demon was gone for good, but she continued to pray for his protection. Alex's behavior did return to normal and he became a happy and healthy child once again. My grandma was grateful for the help that she received and was convinced that it was through faith that her grandson had been saved. She continues to pray for his protection and is grateful every day that he's healthy and happy. The experience had a profound effect on my grandma and she became more devout in her faith. She also became more open to the existence of supernatural entities 
and she continues to believe that there are things in this world that we cannot explain. Looking back on the experience, my grandma remains convinced that Alex was possessed and has taught her to be more watchful of the signs of demonic possession. She continues to believe in the existence of demons and other supernatural entities. As I reflect on my grandma's story, it leaves me with a sense of curiosity, and I wonder about the supernatural world. It makes me wonder what other unexplainable phenomena exists that we have yet to discover or understand. I see a lot of strange stories that come out of New Mexico. It seems like every other day somebody's seeing some kind of mythic creature or a UFO, chupacabra, etc. I used to think that there was no way that all of those things existed in one place. Where would they all hide? Well, I think I sort of figured some of that out. I'm a mailman based out of Los Alamos. The post office works a little differently around here. Not everybody is living together within a few square miles. The folks here are spread out over some pretty impressive distances, and they still need to get their mail. So every day I take a long drive out through the New Mexico desert to deliver bills and packages to the more far-flung residents. Last week, I was out, about an hour away from what we would call the city, when I hit a patch of bad road and I blew a tire. It was horrible timing. I was on my last delivery for the day, and it was late afternoon. It was going to be getting pretty dark soon, too, and the desert gets really cold at night, even in the summer. Even worse, cell phone service is spotty around here, and the road ran along the base of a few hills, so of course, my reception was zilch. My only options were to wait for a car to pass and hope they were willing to help or to hike up the hill and try to get a signal. Eventually, after I didn't report back, the service would send somebody out to find me along the route. But that could literally take hours, and I didn't want to spend the night out here alone. My gas wouldn't last forever, so I chose to hike. Fortunately, I was geared up properly. Plenty of water and sturdy footwear. I could probably make it up and back just before dark. I just hoped that I would get a signal once up top. It was looking like about a 45 minute trek, so I started off and made my way about halfway up the hill when I decided to take a short rest and a water break. Sitting on a rock and taking a few sips from the bottle, I heard some odd sounds. It was like loud chittering. It almost reminded me of cicadas when I lived back east. There are all kinds of bugs out in the desert, I've never heard anything with the sheer volume as this. It seemed like it was coming from behind a rocky outcropping, just a short ways up the hill, directly in the path I had planned on walking. Looking around and not seeing any other route, I decided to just move slowly and see what it was. The thought never even entered my mind that I would soon see an abomination. I was maybe a dozen yards away from the boulder, chittering, not ceasing when I stepped on a loose rock and lost my footing. I kicked up a small spray of dust and pebbles and I slid down a few feet before catching myself. The chittering stopped and it skittered out from behind the boulder. What I saw had to be about five, maybe six feet tall. A thin, chitinous, dusty colored body ending in a head like that of a grasshopper. There were two large antennae sticking out from its crown. A pair of large pinchers extended from its thorax and another smaller pair right beneath that. It skittered quickly left and then right and then left again, stopping 20 feet away. I was overcome with absolute disgust and horror. This monster had stepped right from a sci-fi movie onto the hill in front of me. I was momentarily at a loss. I didn't know if running or fighting was the best option, but taking another look at its pinchers I decided on the former. I walked slowly backward, mimicking its left-right movements. Initially, it stayed put as I began my slow retreat, and then I doubled the distance between us. And then, in a sick instance of irony, my cell phone began to ring loudly. The thing's antenna snapped straight toward me, and then it burst into motion, skittering down the hillside. Making a split-second decision, I tossed myself down the hill, rolling 
bashing and tumbling my way down. I was getting torn up on my descent with dozens of scratches and scrapes. I even hit my head twice, and I was afraid I was going to pass out, but eventually I hit the bottom of the hill near the roadside, next to the mail van. Adrenaline kept me alert and I looked back up and I could see the thing racing towards me. Four stick-like legs pumping up and down. I think I only had seconds. I limped over to the van, threw open the door, and I jumped in, slamming it shut behind me, just as the thing scrambled onto the road. It ran right at the front of the vehicle, jumped on the hood, and then the roof, and I could hear its legs skittering across the metal, and then I felt a series of impacts as it probably tried to punch its way through with its pinchers. If it decided to hit one of those glass windows, I don't know what would have happened. I couldn't just sit there and let the thing make its way in. It seemed sensitive to noise, so I made my decision. I leaned on the horn while simultaneously shouting as loud as I could and rocking back and forth as hard as possible. After a second, the creature fell from the roof, and I could see it land next to the van in the side view. It stood up shakily, walking in a zigzag pattern across the road, wildly. As it got further from the van, it seemed to regain some sense of composure, and eventually it rocketed off up the hill and out of view. I stayed put in the van for about two hours, not daring to leave its safety. Eventually another car came along and gave me a lift back into town. Despite all that action, the van did not receive any discernible damage, and I even got paid a few hours of overtime. I decided not to tell anybody from my personal life about my experience. I don't think anyone would believe me, but I hope you do. I don't think my career choice would ever land me in the sights of something strange. Dangerous, maybe, but I hadn't prepared myself for the outright bizarre experience I had at work. I've been a mall security guard for three years now. Sometimes that means patrolling the parking lot. It never means fighting monsters. But last year, one night tried to change that. I was working an overnight, monitoring the parking lot ahead of an early opening. It's a lonely shift, and I always consider it the most boring. Just driving around slowly with only my music to listen to. But that night, boring very quickly went out the window. I saw some movement by the industrial-sized dumpsters around the back of the complex. We were having issues with vagrants raiding the containers, and it was my job to talk them off of the premises so that the police didn't have to get involved. I crept toward the dumpster slowly with my spotlight fixed on the large green structures. But now, the movement had stopped. Whatever figure I had seen in the darkness was gone. Unless the person had ducked into one of the dumpsters. I don't know why that suspicion possessed me so completely, but I had to investigate. I parked the car and I exited the vehicle, calling out as I searched for the vagrant. There was, of course, no response. And then when I knocked on the largest dumpster, hoping to prompt an answer, something knocked back. It wasn't intelligible or coordinated. It sounded like an animal scurrying around instead of a man digging for discarded treasure. I didn't want to deal with an animal, but I needed to get it out of there. So I figured I could just open the lid of the dumpster and free the intruder. I swallowed my nerves and I summoned some courage. I ended up using the ice scraper from my trunk to prop open the lid of the dumpster. I wedged it open about a foot and I peeked inside. It wasn't an animal. It wasn't a man, either. It was something in between. I don't know. I didn't understand what I was looking at, and I haven't dared try to understand since. The creature filled almost the entire width of the dumpster, and its body was rippling with muscle. From the way it was hunkered down atop the dumpster's debris, I knew right away that it moved on all fours. It was the face that told me I wasn't looking at a feral dog. Its eyes were very human, and they looked sad. It was as if they were pleading with me. And although its face was stretched out in a canine snout, the eyes were still making this vivid expression, like maybe it was frightened. 
I've never seen an animal make that face. I don't know of any animal with the capacity to feel like we can. Maybe the fear we shared was making me hallucinate. Maybe I imagined those human features. We all do stupid things when we're scared. I know I did. I screamed and I dropped the lid and I scrambled backwards. My panic must have stirred the creature. When my back collided with the front end of my vehicle, the thing pulled itself up and out of the dumpster. It hoisted itself upright using its front arms and it glared at me and then it tumbled out of the dumpster. In the spotlight, the beast's features were much easier to make out. Its muscular body was covered in short, thin fur, and its mouth was filled with glistening, pointed teeth. Its stare had transformed from fear to now fury. I guess that's what wild animals do. They fight back when they're scared. I hesitated, hoisting the ice scraper in between us, I didn't plan on fighting it off, I was just trying to avoid the fight that threatened to break out between us. I hoped it would see me standing my ground and run away, but it didn't. Instead it tore towards me, running like its life depended on ending mine. I barely made it to the driver's side door, when the beast's shoulder collided with the frame and slammed the door shut behind me. It thrashed against the car for a moment, swiping at the glass and metal with its clawed hands. I don't know how the glass held up, but I sure am glad that it did. I watched this feral monster try to break into my car, all the while believing that I was doomed. I managed to call the police from the safety of the front seat. Before they arrived, the creature abandoned coming after me. I watched it slink back into the darkness, but didn't dare step out of my car until the lot was filled with the red and blue lights. The police didn't believe me. They accused me of every ignorant crime they could from falsifying a report to wasting their time. When I showed them the dumpster, complete with a patch of fur from the creature, they ignored me. I thought speaking to their supervisor would be wise. It wasn't. They were even quicker to dismiss my claims, and somewhat angry about my persistence. I couldn't have been the first person to see one of these things, right? The creature knew how to get into that dumpster. That means it's been doing it elsewhere. I couldn't help but imagine the poor local who found a monster rummaging through their own garbage. But the police could. They could imagine it because they took the reports, right? And my belief is that they worked to silence them. At least if they went anything like mine. Maybe they were trying to avoid a panic. I don't know. Next time, I'm calling animal control. The stories on your channel always intrigue me. People have had some pretty crazy experiences, and I'm especially drawn to the ones in our great country's national parks. In the vast wilderness, mountains, and deserts, there's bound to be things hidden that we are just unaware of. I can attest to this, and I'd like to share my story. I'm a ranger at the Porcupine Mountains Wilderness State Park, also known as the Porkies off the shores of Lake Superior in Michigan. It was recently ranked the best state park in the country, even beating out parks in Hawaii. Its beauty is breathtaking. My favorite time of year is the fall because of the fiery autumn colors. It's home to picturesque lakes, hiking trails, rivers, waterfalls, even an abandoned mine and ghost town. In the winter, the skiing is incredible. It's the biggest state park in Michigan and home to a lot of wildlife, such as black bears, white-tailed deer, beavers, otters, timber wolves, and moose. But sometimes you hear stories of other, more mysterious things that lurk in the Porkies. Believe it or not, Lake Superior has its very own resident lake monster known as Pessy. And while I do have a story about that, I'll save it for another day. This story is about something that resides in the woods. One summer, we received reports of vandalism at the abandoned Nunsuch Copper Mine and Ghost Town, which is in a more remote area of the park. There's a trail to the Nunsuch Falls that passes by many of the old mine ruins and the abandoned shafts. These are fenced off with signs due to safety and preservation concerns. 
I was sent to check it out, and I was surprised to see one of the mine shaft structures pretty badly damaged. The strange thing was, it looked like something burst out from inside the shaft, with rocks and rubble scattered about. As I looked around, I made out what appeared to be large footprints in the dirt, leading to the surrounding woods. Once in a while, we do get reports of Bigfoot sightings, but they always turn out to be nothing. At the time, I had trouble believing this could actually be a Bigfoot, but I took pictures of the prints and the ruins to report to my supervisor. Against my better judgment, I followed the footprints to see where they went. But the further I went into the woods, the more obscured they became. I was able to make out some broken branches and other telltale signs of something lumbering through there, but then I caught a whiff of a horrible stench, like rotting meat. I kept going deeper into the woods and finally came across the carcass of a bear. It looked like it had been dead for a few days, it was partially eaten, but what made me nervous was that the bear was torn apart with a ferocity that I had never seen before. I couldn't imagine what could possibly do that to a bear, but it had to be massive and powerful. I finally decided it was time to get out of there. As I hustled back to the main trail, I was assaulted by another pungent stench, even worse than the carcass. It was the overwhelming smell of urine, wet dog, sulfur. And then I heard a strange whooping sound nearby. Just thinking about it as I write this sends a chill up my spine. It didn't sound like any animal I was familiar with. Something about it was just so primal. I quickened my pace and finally got to the trail and the ruins. I stopped for a moment to catch my breath, but I was suddenly pelted with rocks. They were coming from somewhere in the trees, but I couldn't see who or what was doing it. I heard that whooping sound again, closer this time, and I took off as fast as I could. Whatever it was didn't seem to follow me, but I didn't stop until I got back to my truck. I raced to the ranger station and I reported everything to my supervisor. I showed him the pictures. He listened but didn't say a word and I couldn't tell if he believed me or not. Together we looked through trail cam footage around Nunsuch and while we didn't see anything definitive, we did see a large figure covered in hair lurking in the foliage. It was too broad and humanoid to be a bear. My supervisor grabbed copies of the pictures from my phone, but then told me to delete them immediately. I was confused, but he insisted that I do it right in front of him. He was serious, and for my own job security, I did what I was told. He said not to tell anybody about it for the time being. The next day, he called me into his office and reiterated that the DNT Parks and Recreation wanted to keep the situation quiet. They didn't want to scare tourists and visitors unnecessarily. I reminded him of the mutilated bear carcass, and I said it might actually be necessary after all. He just told me that it would be handled, and that we were to stay out of it. Camping areas and hiking trails around Nunsuch Falls, Little Iron River, and Lost Creek were temporarily closed. I noticed then some military vehicles driving into the area with armed men dressed in camo. At first I thought it was the National Guard, but there were no markings on the vehicles or their uniforms. I tried to follow them, but I was immediately stopped and told to stay away. A few days later, my supervisor informed me that the situation was resolved, whatever that meant, and the camping areas and hiking trails were reopened. I went back to the Nunsuch mine ruins and I was surprised to see that the destroyed mine shaft structure had been rebuilt. A bit haphazard, but close enough to the way that it was before. That creature was never seen again. I don't know what happened to it, but I shudder to think what those armed men might have done. Who knows where it actually came from, but maybe this thing lived in the abandoned mines, like a troglodyte or something. I couldn't help but think that maybe there were more of them down there, down below, and that one day they would rise up again. I know that sounds crazy. I've kept a vigilant watch in the area ever since, but thankfully, we haven't had any issues. Not yet, at least. Hi everyone, today's episode is sure to blow your socks off. 
I have three stories that reveal fascinating information, information that will make you wonder if the things you know are really true. You might even reconsider everything you've ever learned. But first, please snuggle up and pull your socks up tight, then get to know that subscribe button. Thanks. Now let's get into the stories. I've never told this story before. I didn't think anyone would believe me. I know it sounds crazy, but it happened, and it's the reason I never go hiking alone in the woods anymore. There are a few public hiking trails near my house in northern Illinois. The local state park is divided across a river. The more populated side has a swimming beach and a bunch of picnic areas, while the other side of the park is pretty secluded. Not many people know about the other side of the park. It's roughly a five-mile drive from the main entrance. You have to get back on the country road and head south until you reach another dirt road. It doesn't even have a road sign and there are weeds growing down the middle of the road between the wear of the tire tracks. You drive down the dirt road for about two miles and there's a parking lot on your left. Blink and you'll miss it. The parking lot is just a gravel lot surrounded by an old wooden fence. There's room for about four vehicles, but I rarely ever saw anybody else there. A little brown sign posted at the edge of the fence states that you're entering state park land and to pay any fees at the main park office. There's only one trail on this side of the park, and it's a six-mile loop that winds through mostly wooded area. The trail passes through a couple of prairies, but they aren't terribly large. I preferred this side of the park because I fancied myself an amateur photographer and there were more opportunities to take nature photos over here. I was particularly interested in taking photos of songbirds and I would always see a greater variety on this trail than I would anywhere else, especially the main part of the park. I don't know how many times I hiked that trail. It must have been nearly a hundred. And I never once felt anything strange there. But then again, I always stayed on the trail. Once in a while, I would venture maybe 10 yards into the woods to get a good photo, but that was it. Like I said, I was an amateur. I wasn't looking for National Geographic. A smaller trail split off from the main trail deep in the woods. You could tell it was definitely not part of the state park trail, but it had been well-traveled. I never saw anybody on it, but I very rarely ever saw anybody else out there at all. My experience happened in late July. I had just gotten off work and I wanted to get some photos in the evening light, so I headed out to my secluded trail. The sun sets about 9 p.m. in the summer, so I definitely had plenty of time after work to hike that trail and to be back to the car before dark. My hike seemed normal enough, but when I got to the part where that small trail started, I noticed that it was roped off. The park service had posted a sign that said, Hidden Falls area closed due to erosion damage. Keep out. Now I had heard about Hidden Falls, but I never knew exactly where it was before that day. It was just a tiny waterfall that led into the river, but it wasn't anywhere on the map. I know I should have listened to the sign, but I wanted to see the waterfall for myself. And of course, it could be a good photo opportunity. So down the trail I went. I didn't notice any erosion damage on the way down, but I had never been on that trail before, so I didn't really have anything to compare to. The trail led almost straight down and the foliage became denser, so much so that it was difficult carrying my camera bag through it. The brush was so thick that I could hear the waterfall well before I saw it. The forest suddenly opened up, and there it was. Hidden Falls was aptly named. It was only about three quarters of a mile from the main trail, but you would never have even known it was there. It was almost magical, like somewhere straight out of a fairy tale. The evening sunlight pierced through the trees and lit up the falling water, so I immediately pulled out my camera and began taking photos. I was only there for about ten minutes when I heard laughing. It didn't sound exactly like a human voice, though. There was something off about it. I looked around and I couldn't see anybody else. I called out and said, who's there? But I didn't get a response. I started to pack up my camera then when I heard the laugh again. And this time it sounded like it was coming from the stream itself. I listened closer and I was certain it was at the stream. I stuffed my camera back into my bag and I wanted to get the hell out of there, but just as I stood up to leave, it had suddenly gotten dark. And I don't mean dark like the sun was setting. I mean dark like the middle of the night. 
I looked at my watch and it said 6.45 and I knew I had about two hours of sunlight left, but it was dark. I could see stars through the gaps in the trees. I didn't know what was going on, but I knew something wasn't right and I had to get myself back to the car as fast as I could. I got on the trail heading out and luckily used my cell phone as a flashlight. As I climbed out, I heard the laughing again, but this time it sounded like it was coming from the trees. So I shone my light at the trees, but couldn't see anything there. Only the dark outlines of branches and leaves. But then I caught it, a pair of eyes reflecting back at me. They stared at me for a moment, and then the laughing began again. I held the light towards the creature, and it showed itself for just a moment. It ducked from beneath some branches and stood there in the light. It was a coyote, standing about 30 feet up a tree. It looked at me, tilted its head, and it smiled. But not like a dog smile. I don't quite know how to describe it, but I knew it wasn't a coyote then, even though it looked like one. Its eyes were reflecting the light from my phone, so I couldn't just see what it looked like. At least not exactly. I didn't stay there long either because as soon as it revealed itself, it laughed again, and I ran. I could barely see where I was going, but I didn't care. I knew I needed to get away. I tripped over the rope at the beginning of the trail, and I have never felt such relief. The sky was light again, and it was as if nothing had happened. You won't be surprised to hear that I never went back to that park, and I never figured out just what that coyote actually was or what it wanted. I'm not even sure I want to know, to be truthful. But no one can tell me that the Park Service doesn't know that that thing exists. There wasn't any noticeable erosion damage on that trail. That sign was definitely put there to keep people away. To keep people from meeting that creature. I don't have a personal encounter per se, but I believe this story should be told nonetheless. And I'm curious if anybody else out there has had a similar experience or has seen anything in the wild that they can't explain. My tale starts at a history museum in the western United States. I used to work there for quite a while. I don't want to say the name of the museum, but I will say that we were near the Rocky Mountains. My personal area of study was prehistoric. I quite liked the challenge of trying to piece things together from a time before written records. You have to be both a scientist and a historian to get things right. And even then, some things still remain a mystery despite your best efforts. After spending eight years on my education, I taught for several years and I did many field studies. I didn't expect I would end up working at a museum, but I can't complain too much. We had quite an extensive collection of artifacts from various ages of prehistory. I loved cataloging items in the archives as well as answering questions from curious minds. All types of people would come to the museum, but I admit that I was quite surprised to see two local park rangers in their uniforms waiting for me at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning. They wanted to know my thoughts on a couple of ancient tools. That's not typically abnormal. Sometimes people will find artifacts and bring them in. The rangers had brought me two fluted spear points and a scrapper. I remember them well. They were made in the Clovis style. The rangers didn't want to tell me at first where they were found, but I started to put the pieces together, and eventually they told me the story. And it was quite a story at that. There had been a few sightings of wild men in remote locations around the mountains, both in the United States and in Canada. I'm not talking about national parks or heavily populated hiking trails, but instead backpackers who head way off marked trails. People exploring deep into the wilderness, often in near untouched areas. The rangers that patrolled this particular area had received a report from two hikers who claimed to have seen a wild-looking man in the backcountry with no gear. The area was surrounded by miles of wilderness with no access roads nearby. The hikers recorded the GPS coordinates of where they saw the man and reported it to the ranger station. The rangers investigated this particular incident, and after a long search, they found a cave with a primitively built structure around the outside. Something similar to a hut or a lean-to with a woven roof is the way they described it. They said they found these tools in the cave along with several others, and there were signs of recent human activity. I had to check my calendar to see if this was an April Fool's joke, 
It would have been a great one, but the rangers were dead serious. The tools they had presented me were near identical recreations of the Clovis style of tools found in America around 13,000 years ago. I still didn't quite believe them, though. I'm quite skeptical of an unknown population's ability to remain hidden in the wilderness for so many years without any contact with the modern world. Why haven't we had more sightings of these wild people? And if they're out there, what exactly are they? The tools certainly looked Clovis, but the Clovis people disappeared around 9,000 years ago. The rangers both theorized that they could be responsible for the Sasquatch sightings that seemed to be prevalent throughout the continent. I think there's more to it than that, but I don't have any plausible theories myself. I asked the rangers to bring me to the site, but they refused. Imagine what we could learn from these people if they actually do exist out there. There are so many things that we don't know about their culture. We could learn what language they spoke. I can't really explain what an incredible find this would be for us historians. If the story is true, these people sound like they're living just like they were roughly 13,000 years ago, when they were hunting mammoths and mastodons across the plains. I imagine they must still be hunting big game with those fluted spear points. I do understand the rangers' reservations, though. If such a thing got out, I don't imagine it would go well for the wild people. They likely have no immunity to our diseases, and I don't suppose they would welcome us with open arms should we try to find them. But I can't tell you how badly I wanted to see that sight. I would have done anything. Both of the rangers said the sightings were in extremely remote areas, so remote that it was surprising to even find hikers there. And they hope to leave whatever or whoever is living out there alone for the time being. Their curiosity got the best of them, so they found me. I was the verification they needed. This experience happened to me about 15 years ago now, and I still think about it quite often. I found myself taking long hiking trips in remote locations across the continent, but I haven't yet had a sighting of my own. If they are indeed out there, and this wasn't an elaborate prank, they're keeping themselves very well hidden. They're doing it very well. Hi Lilith. Something happened to me over the summer and I finally feel ready to tell the story. I live in Montana, a state known for wide open ranges, high mountains, and the best of all, trout fishing. I guess I've seen a river runs through it too many times because I spend nearly every single free moment of my time out on nearby rivers and streams fly fishing. There are about a dozen different bodies of water within an hour's drive, and each one has quality trout fishing. While Montana is relatively unpopulated, some of the more popular places can get a little crowded during the busy months. Every serious fisherman has their own secluded secret spot, and I'm no exception. I found it a few years ago and have seen maybe two other people on the stream in all that time. I was there on the day that this story takes place. It's about a two-hour drive from my home in Polson, so I left the house a little bit before dawn. I had fishing buddies but never showed anyone else the secret spot. After the drive and a further hour hike, I was on the river. It was a clear day and the river's wide enough that you can see pretty far both up and downstream. I hit some of my usual spots like deep pools, downed trees, and some shallow rapids. The morning was warm and it was beginning to heat up quickly as the sun rose. Trout tend to get lethargic in warm weather and I was afraid it was going to be a waste of a day. I really didn't want to leave empty-handed so I decided to walk upstream a bit. Maybe I would find a mountain stream runoff which would make the water in the vicinity a little cooler. I fished my way upstream maybe two or three miles alternating between walking along the bank and wading in the river. I had never really explored this stretch of the river before, and the land before me became wilder and more beautiful with every step. And that's saying something for Montana. Despite the captivating scenery, I caught this strange feeling that I couldn't quite seem to shake. It felt like I was walking into an area where I didn't belong. Like I had stepped back into a time when man was at the bottom of the food chain. The rocks and the boulders became more jagged and uneven, and even the trees seemed to loom larger, like towering sentinels peering down at a clumsy intruder. 
I did my best to ignore the feeling and I just kept casting out, hoping my fly would get noticed. Fortunately, the water became a little shallower and I was able to wade further out into the water and create some more casting room. It was while I was standing in the center of the river mid-cast when I noticed it. Across the river on the opposite bank, one of the trees began moving, and then another, shaking violently. I could see leaves and pine cones falling from above to the forest floor. Something was moving from deep in the forest, heading in my direction. And whatever it was, it was big enough to make a 60-foot tree shake and sway as if it was a hurricane. I yanked all my line in with my hand and I grabbed it up in a bundle. No doubt it was a tangled mess, but I had bigger problems to worry about right then. Wading through water is tough and I probably wasn't going to get back to the shoreline before this thing emerged from the other side, but what choice did I have? I turned and I came as close to a run as I could and I kept having to feel around with my feet to find my next safe stepping spot. I kept pushing forward and I could begin hearing a massive thump thump coming from behind. It was getting louder with each passing heartbeat. Now terrified, I threw my $500 rod into the water and I began taking long, risky steps, just praying that I didn't step into a hole or slip into the water. Plenty of fishermen have drowned after falling in and having their waders filled with water. I had almost reached the other bank when I heard a thunderous crash behind me. I couldn't help but turn and look. As if out of a fantasy book, this literal giant stood before me. It was at least half the height of the 50-foot pine trees. A patchwork garment of a dozen elk skins covered it from the waist down. This gargantuan fist held down at both of its sides seemed as if it could envelop me whole. I was somewhere between full terror and complete awe. A living creature of legend was standing in front of me. Its eyes were the size of pumpkins, and they locked with mine and held my gaze. And then it opened its mouth. This was the only time in my life that I can say that I felt a noise. Inhaling a tremendous breath, the creature roared a single explosive word. Go! Mimicking the size of the creature, the single word was long and expansive. I hadn't initially comprehended that the thing had just spoken. I just stood unresponsive with my mouth open, standing in the water up to my thighs. The creature stooped and uprooted a two-ton boulder from the rocky shore. Single-handedly, it pulled that boulder back and launched it like a catapult, the stone monolith slamming into the water just ten yards away from me. Then a shower of water and rocks and wood rained down on me and I had to cover my hands with my head. Several smaller stones ricocheted from the tossed boulder hitting me all over, which later turned into nasty purple welts. Snapping out of my stupefaction and realizing just how threatening this situation was, I began racing towards the shoreline, kicking my legs high out of the water. I felt like a flamingo. Back turned to the monster, I felt another impact somewhere behind me, and globs of water soaked me even further. I was breathing hard, and I felt a surge of relief when my foot hit the rocky bank. I climbed out without looking back, and I raced towards the tree line as quickly as my soaked clothing would let me. I ran 30 feet into the woods before tripping and falling face-first onto the ground, and when I stood up and turned back toward the river, I could see the immense creature lumbering back into the forest on the far side of the water. I stood there watching and listening, and its loud thumps slowly faded away until I could no longer see the tips of the tree swaying from its passing. I quickly returned to my truck, and I went home. I know this sounds far-fetched, like a child's fairy tale or something from Lord of the Rings, but it happened. I thought about calling the police, or even the media, but in the end, I decided not to. This thing could have easily killed me, but all it did was chase me away. It just wanted solitude and to be left alone, something I can relate to. That's why I went there in the first place anyway, but... I won't be returning to disturb it. I'm only sending this in as a message. Maybe there are things in the world, creatures and such, that should be left alone. Maybe we just need to stop trying to find them. The Pacific Northwest can be merciless, especially during fire season. Climate change has only made matters worse. There are more fires and more risks. 
Those are the risks we all accepted, though. We all knew what we were getting into when we began our training to become wildland firefighters. Still, there are some things out there that none of us are prepared for. And one of those things we ran into last summer. A wildfire had been spreading for a few days. We were working tirelessly establishing fire lines and setting backfires to limit the spread. Things were turning in our favor. The perpetual glow of the fire in the distance made lighting our campsite irrelevant. We could light and extinguish as many little fires as we pleased, but that wouldn't hurt or help our visibility. What we did need, however, was a constant source of fresh water. We were supplementing our supply with water from a nearby stream, which we purified each night for consumption the next day. Occasionally, that meant that one of us would trek alone to the stream and refill a few of the containers. It was my turn at the stream, and that was when the creature came for me. My eyes were on the water when a growl came from the opposite side of the bank. It was faint at first, so low that I mistook it as the ambient sounds of the fire in the distance. But then, it got louder. When it heightened to its greatest pitch and sounded most like a scream, it stopped suddenly. But then my gaze had snapped upwards, was scanning the spaces between the trees looking for a bear or a cougar. The few heartbeats that passed felt like a millennium. I saw nothing. I heard nothing. But then, the beast wanted to be seen. I watched a great hulking mass step out from the shadows. The red glow of the fires painted its shaggy fur this unforgettable shade of orange and red. It must have been approaching eight feet tall. I had never felt so small. I'd seen every part of a forest fire before. I had seen the way it changed and scared the animals that lived there. I always felt like I was fulfilling a purpose at that moment. But looking at this animal, though, I felt nothing. Its eyes caught the light and reflected it back at me. It wanted me to see those eyes. It wanted me to stare into them. Otherwise, why would it have stayed? It lingered there. Was it judging me? Was it appraising me for my work in trying to stop the fire that was burning through its home? If that was the case, it found me unworthy. Maybe it didn't understand what we were doing there. Maybe it just didn't like the way the smoke had clung to my skin. I smelled like the very thing that was destroying the forest. Why would this creature trust me? Suddenly it snapped a branch off of the nearest tree and hurled it in my direction. I'm lucky that the beast's aim was slightly off. The branch plunged into the earth beside me and sunk deep into the mud. That could have been my body. I didn't stick around to give the creature another chance. As I saw it step toward me with a large five-toed foot, I turned to run. I dropped the water. The men were going to hate me for that, but my life was on the line. They would have to understand. I yelled with every lunge, every desperate duck beneath the foliage, and I prayed that I would make it back to my group before the giant creature caught up with me. Maybe with enough of us together, the thing would back off. Another branch smashed against the tree trunk to my left. I felt pieces of wood scrape my face as the limb exploded upon impact. I couldn't believe how powerful the thing behind me truly was. And then I did it. I broke through the wall of undergrowth and into the clearing where we had forged the campsite. The other members of my crew did not hesitate to help. They stood together and prepared to defend one another from whatever monster was chasing me in the woods. I know that they were expecting the same as me, a bear or a wildcat. When nothing appeared, the murmurs began. They accused me of playing a prank. They predictably scolded me for leaving the water behind and unattended. The color draining from my face and the shivers that refused to pass only convinced a few of them that I was telling the truth. I didn't sleep for the rest of our time there. I found myself constantly drifting back to the trees, waiting for the next moment that the creature wanted to reveal itself to me. But that never came. As fire season approaches again, I find myself wondering if I'm on borrowed time. How long before the monster of the woods reappears? How many more times could I have dodged the things it was throwing at me? Maybe, if I'm lucky, the fires won't bring me back to that area. I don't know how I'll focus if I'm out there again. 
I know that thing's lurking, stealthy, and quiet despite its size. I do know that if it does reappear, I'll make sure that somebody else sees it too. I'm tired of no one believing me. I haven't given up on telling this story, but the face of rejection and disbelief does get tiring. Do you believe me? Have you ever seen anything like the animal I saw last summer? I need to convince as many people as possible. I want to know what it is. I want to know why it attacked. To learn that, I'll need believers. How else could I take this story back to my supervisors? How can I persuade anyone to care about an animal that they don't believe in? My family and I were driving from Michigan to Arizona to visit my sister who had just moved there. It was a long trip, nearly 2,000 miles, but we were excited to see her and explore the area near her new place. We had all been on the road for a few days, and we were somewhere in the middle of Colorado when the incident happened. I'm a school teacher. My husband works in IT. We have two children, a 10-year-old daughter, and an 8-year-old son. We planned the road trip to coincide with their summer break so we could spend some quality time. It was late at night and we were driving through a rural area with no cell phone service. We were listening to music and the kids were sleeping in the back. My husband and I were chatting when we simultaneously saw something on the side of the road. At first we thought it was a hitchhiker, but as we got closer we realized it was something else entirely. It was a humanoid figure but covered in fur, walking upright on its hind legs. It had piercing, glowing yellow eyes like none either of us had seen before. The creature was about six feet tall and had long, sharp claws. It freaked us both out. We both commented on it, asking out loud what it was. We stopped to get a better look, and the creature turned its head and looked directly at us. It hunched with its head down. We knew immediately from the look on its face and the aggressive stance that it was not friendly. And then out of nowhere, it lunged at our car, scratching the door with its claws. We were terrified. We tried to call for help on our cell phones, but we couldn't catch a signal. We were completely alone in the middle of nowhere with this insane creature coming at us. The creature continued to scratch at the doors and tried to break through. We knew that we were in danger. We tried to drive away but it was too fast and it kept up with us easily. We were panicking and worried about our children's safety. We didn't know how to protect them or escape this creature. It was a total nightmare. The creature then jumped on the hood of our car and we could feel its weight pressing down on the metal. We were afraid that it would break through, attack us. My husband swerved and was able to fling the creature off the car and then we took off down the road with our kids losing it in the back seat. After driving a while, we finally found a gas station with a working phone. We called the police, who came out to investigate. They didn't believe our story at first, but when they saw the scratches and the damage to the car, it was obvious that something strange had happened. The police ended up calling a local Native American tribe who had extensive knowledge of the area and the local wildlife. They told us that what we encountered was a skinwalker a powerful and dangerous creature that could shapeshift into different forms. The tribe members explained that the skinwalker was a malevolent being that could transform into any animal or human form, and that it was known to attack and harm humans. They told us that the skinwalker had been following us for some time, and that we were lucky to have escaped with our lives. The tribe members shared that the skinwalker was a cursed individual who had gained supernatural powers through dark magic. They were once human, but had made a deal with an evil spirit to gain powers, evil powers, and in turn they were cursed to spend their life as a skinwalker. The tribe members also revealed that skinwalkers were rare and only found in specific areas of the country, and that their existence was not widely known or acknowledged. They warned us to keep our encounter a secret and not to share it with anybody else. After the tribe members performed a cleansing ritual on us and our car, they advised us to leave the area immediately and to not stop until we reached a safe location. We took their advice, and we drove to a nearby town where we spent the night in a hotel, grateful to be alive and safe. 
The encounter with the Skinwalker left us all in shock. We couldn't believe that such creatures existed and how close we had come to serious harm. We were also grateful for the help that we received from the police and the Native American tribe. In the weeks that followed, we researched more about skinwalkers and Native American culture and folklore. We learned that they were not to be taken lightly, and that encountering one was a rare and terrifying experience, and most people who come into contact don't make it out alive. We also realized that the world was more mystical and strange than we will ever know. The encounter with the skinwalker was life-changing for us. It taught us to be more aware of our surroundings and to respect the power of nature and the supernatural. We also realized that there was much more to the world than what we saw on the surface, and that we needed to open our minds to the possibilities of life in the universe. It also made us realize that some mysteries were never meant to be discovered. We learned to respect the boundaries of different cultures and traditions, and to be more mindful of the consequences of our actions. I love listening to your channel, but to be honest, I'm mostly waiting to hear somebody with a similar experience to me. Let me explain. The first time I saw them, I was a teenager. Who is them, you ask? I hesitate to say it because it's so laughable, but let me be clear. The last thing they are is funny. I used to roll my eyes whenever somebody would talk about aliens and UFOs. The only thing I could conjure up in my mind was E.T., that strange-looking creature with the long neck, big eyes, and a light bulb for a fingertip. I saw the movie when I was a kid, so to me, aliens were these friendly, candy-eating things that just wanted to go home. I assure you, this is not an accurate portrayal. My first encounter with them was when I was 14, even though it was nearly 20 years ago, I'll never forget it. Have you ever had a lucid dream? A dream so vivid that you thought it was real? That's what it was like. I went to bed one night, worried about the science test I had the next day. I didn't study, and I needed a good grade, otherwise I was looking at summer school. I was so stressed out, I had trouble sleeping, and I would wake up at the slightest disturbance. Wind blowing in the trees, Dad snoring neighbor's dog barking. I remember waking up to this bright light coming through the window, like a giant spotlight. I covered my eyes, wondering what was going on. It was blinding, but it only lasted a few seconds and then quickly dissipated. But that's when the nightmare began. When the light died down, I became aware of this sickening stench, like rotten garbage. Can you even smell in dreams? I didn't think so. And it was then that I saw a silhouette standing at the foot of my bed. I tried to sit up, but I couldn't move a muscle. I was frozen in place, and I could only move my eyes to look around. I guess it was like sleep paralysis. The figure didn't look human. It didn't look like E.T. either, but it was kind of similar. Short, with a large, bulbous head, long, skinny neck, slender body, and arms. It slowly moved around the bed towards me, but it didn't walk. It sort of floated. As it got closer, I could see large oval black eyes, and I had never seen anything like that. They were blacker than black, like a void, emptiness that stretched into infinity. The creature reached out its hand and extended its index finger. No, it didn't light up. It touched my forehead, and suddenly I heard voices. It was like it was kind of flipping through the channels on a radio with different languages until it finally settled on an English-speaking station. A voice called me by my name and said they had been looking for me. To say I was petrified would be an understatement. The creature leaned in and I kept staring into those black voids until they swallowed me. Next thing I knew, I was in an antiseptic room that had no walls. I don't know how to describe it, but there was no depth. And as vast as it seemed, it was also claustrophobic at the same time. I was strapped to some kind of a gurney and I couldn't move. The most horrifying part was that I was now surrounded by seven of these creatures, and they were all looming over me. One of them reached out and grabbed me by the jaw, forcing my mouth open. I'll never forget the clammy feeling of its hands against my face. There was no warmth, nothing like a human touch. It was cold, dead. 
another being then held up this contraption that I can only describe as a drill made out of flesh and bone. I tried to scream, but nothing came out of my mouth. I was a prisoner, trapped in my own body, and only my consciousness remained. These creatures then shoved that drill down my throat, and I felt every ounce of pain and discomfort. I heard a voice in my head. It was them, speaking telepathically again telling me that I was part of some experiment and that I should be honored that I was chosen. I'm not going to lie, honor was not the first feeling that came to my mind. And whatever that contraption was, I felt it slither down my throat, into my stomach, and wind through my intestines. I'll spare you the details of where it came out, but you can use your imagination. The next thing I knew, I bolted up in bed, coughing and gagging clutching my throat as the alarm chirped on the nightstand and the morning sunlight was pouring through the window. I grabbed that damn alarm and chucked it across the room. At the time, I thought it was just a dream, but my throat and stomach were sore. Not like I was sick, but like something had been rammed down my throat and ripped out. Needless to say, I failed my science test. My parents weren't happy about it, but I never told them what happened that night. I struggled for a long time afterwards, trying to determine if it was real or not. And only recently have I come to the conclusion that, yes, it was very real. What led to that decision? Well, it happened again, just last week. Same dream, only this time they said I was about to enter a new phase of the experiment. When I woke up, there was a small lump on my stomach and a tiny scar what scares me about that lump is that it has grown a little larger each day. I'm totally afraid to go to the doctor. I'm afraid to go to sleep. I can't tell anybody, not even my family or friends, because they'll think I'm crazy. But I thought the listeners of this channel might understand. If you believe in God, please pray for me. It was just another day at work. I was going through the motions, doing my job, and not expecting anything out of the ordinary to happen. Of course, who does expect anything to happen that's not part of their typical day? At the time, I was working as an FBI agent, and I was assigned to a case that had me completely stumped. I had been working on it for weeks, trying to find any clues or leads that could help me solve it, or even just move forward a bit but nothing was leading anywhere despite everything I tried, and I was extremely frustrated. So, on the night in question, I was in my home office late at night. I was divorced, and I lived alone, and I often would find myself unable to sleep. On those nights, I would head to my office to work. So that particular night, I was going through the files and hoping for a breakthrough, when I heard a noise that was unusual. It was just different enough from anything I was used to hearing around the house that it caught my attention. Not to mention, it was around 2 o'clock in the morning. It sounded like something heavy was hitting the ground, and it was coming from the big open yard behind the house. I stood up, and I cocked my head to the side to try and pinpoint the exact location. But as I listened closer, I realized that it sounded like it might actually be much closer to the house. Like basically right outside the kitchen door. I stepped away from my desk and I moved towards my office door. My office was just down the hall from the kitchen and so I opened the door slowly and stepped out to investigate. But first, I listened again to be sure I was correct on the direction it was coming from. Sure enough, I heard it again from the area outside, off the kitchen. I now started to make my way down the hallway to the kitchen and as I got closer, the noise got louder. I reached the kitchen and I looked towards the door. The noise had gone silent now, almost like whatever was making it knew I was tracking it. But I was determined to get to the bottom of this and so I slowly and very quietly opened the door to the outside. When I did, I could not grasp what I was seeing. Standing just outside the kitchen door and moving around and making the noise I had heard earlier was a creature. That's the best I can categorize it. A creature unlike anything I had ever seen before. It was about seven feet tall and totally covered in fur. It had a long snout with sharp teeth protruding at odd angles. 
The creature turned towards me when the door opened, almost like it instinctively knew I was there because I was 100% quiet when I opened the door. The thing focused on me intently with rage in its eyes, and it started coming at me screeching and howling and hissing so that saliva was flying everywhere. I stepped back inside and I shut the door to put some distance between me and it. I had to think fast and determine a suitable plan of action. I decided to head back to my office where I hoped to watch it, undetected from my office window. I then proceeded to look through the window, but it wasn't long before I heard the sounds of the creature breaking into the house, breaking in through the kitchen door. Now I really had to calculate quickly, but I knew how to act fast and I pulled out my gun and I aimed it down the hallway as I slowly opened the office door and positioned myself out of its sight. I could hear but not see the creature in the kitchen. I listened as it was moving around with a lot of force, banging and stepping heavily. I could also hear it growling and snorting as it moved about. It sounded like something out of a horror movie. I thought that if I just stayed quiet enough, it might just leave which would have been the optimal outcome. I listened to it for a while in the kitchen, but then I heard it go into the dining room. It now sounded like it was just destroying things in there. I could hear glass breaking and furniture being shoved around. It seemed to be very angry. Finally, I opened my office door all the way and I stepped out completely into the hallway. I slowly walked towards the dining room with my gun still raised. As soon as I got close and I turned the corner, it turned its head towards me and instantly started to growl menacingly. It had a look on its face like it wanted to tear me apart right there. For a second, I thought for sure that this is how I would die. But instead of rushing and attacking me, it suddenly went silent again. And then I watched as it rushed back to the kitchen and hurled itself out through the back door. I didn't know what to think at that point. On one hand, I was relieved that it had left, but at the same time, I somehow felt that this meant there was a war between us. And so I decided then and there that I would find out more about this thing. To be honest, my confusion and fear then turned into anger. I wanted to know who or what this thing was and why it had come into my house and destroyed it. Since that day, I've done a lot of research, mainly on the internet but it was difficult finding anything that really matched what happened. Like the way it came into my house and started breaking things. That seemed to be unusual. But just like many of the other descriptions, this thing was bipedal, had pointed ears and canine-like teeth. It also had a very strong odor that I can still smell in my memory. I'm not sure what this means, but I really feel that there's some kind of connection between these creatures and myself now. And so I will continue my research until I find out more. I've actually become a bit obsessed with cryptids since this experience. I started to research them and I'm learning as much as possible about their habits and locations. Eventually, I retired from my work with the FBI and I'm now putting my skills to work becoming an expert on cryptid sightings around the country. I don't have anything online yet. I'm just amassing a giant library of it all right now right here in my house, the same house where it all started with that one mind-blowing encounter. I can pinpoint the exact day when everything changed, and it all started with what I believe was a dogman encounter. I was driving home from work on a Friday night, and I was driving my wife's small Toyota Corolla. Anyway, at this time of day, there wasn't a lot of traffic along the roads, but as I rounded a curve, I could see this enormous dog standing off in the distance. But it didn't look like any average dog. It had the markings of a dog and the shape, but it looked to be at least seven and a half feet tall. It had dark brown fur with white markings on its chest and legs. And it was standing upright, straight up like a person would, on two legs. Actually, from this distance, it reminded me a lot of my old neighbor's dog, a Great Pyrenees, but that might just be because it was so big. This dog also had a very wide positioning with its front paws that actually looked like hands. They were out in front, like it was guarding something. 
Even from about 40 feet away, I could see the muscles rippling under its fur as it stood there looking directly at me sitting in the car, still holding its hands out as if to keep me away. The vast majority of dogs run away from cars as they approach, so I assumed that this would do the same thing. But as I approached within about 25 feet or so, this dog stood still, motionless, as if it was waiting for me to do something. I rolled down my window and yelled, but still it didn't move. I wanted to get around it, but when I moved to the side to pass, it took a giant step and continued blocking me. Realizing that this dog thing was intent on keeping me there, I started to get worried. I turned the wheel to try to go around it, but as I began moving, it dropped down on all fours and started running towards me at full speed. I had never seen an animal move like that before. Not that fast. It was very gracefully galloping along like a horse, but its gait was off somehow, as if its front legs were bending in this awkward way. My brain was finally starting to realize that this was not a normal dog like I had been rationalizing that it was. I gunned the engine to pull away from it as quickly as possible, but by now it was too close for me to avoid hitting it, even if I had wanted to. When my front bumper came within about two feet of its chest, this giant creature jumped over the hood of my car and landed on the roof with a loud thud and stayed up there. As I looked in my rearview mirror, I could see it looking back at me through the windshield with a look on its face as if to say, Are you afraid now? I immediately sped up and hoped to knock it off the roof and get out of there. But when I did, this thing jumped off the roof and onto the trunk, slamming into it. But it stayed there, propping itself on by holding on to the rear spoiler, still looking at me. I knew that it had more than likely dented up my car, so I started slowing down and I eventually came to a stop. Luckily, by this time, I could see another car coming up behind me, and I needed their help. I didn't want them to pass, so I got out and I stood in the road with my hands out, waving them frantically, pointing to the thing on my car. The other car pulled over, and three college-age kids got out, two guys and a girl. They ran towards me just as the creature stepped off the trunk and started walking towards them, but still looking at me, as if to keep me from leaving. The kids stopped running, stood in place, and they all realized that this thing was coming at them. It then sniffed the air a few times as it got close and circled around them a few times, then turned back and started running full speed toward me again. I watched as it got closer and closer, and when it got to about 15 feet or so, it quickly dodged out of the way and off to the side of the road. We had a standoff with this creature, with the four of us barely moving an inch and just watching it with our eyes. We also glanced back and forth at each other without moving our bodies at all, but the looks we gave said more than words ever could. Soon into this standoff, the dog creature turned its head up towards the sky and let out a scream that sounded half human, half wolf. It pierced through the air in a way that felt like the noise could knock over trees. I know that's a really strange thought, but the sound was sharp, if that makes any sense. I looked at these kids and I asked what the thing was but they just stared back at me, silently. Finally, one of them was able to speak and said they didn't know what the hell it was. I said I didn't know either, but I sure thought that it could have been a dog man that we all just experienced. That's when I told them that we should get in our cars and leave before this thing does something else to us. It was now looking around, and I was worried that it had called out to more of its kind with that call. We all slowly got into our respective cars without looking at each other or acknowledging each other in any way. We were kind of on autopilot. It felt like there was an unspoken agreement between us about not wanting to say anything out loud so as not to snap that thing back into charging us. We all knew and understood that we had to get out of there ASAP. We were all on the same page. I got into my car and started driving slowly past where it was standing, hoping it would stay put. It didn't, though. It started running after my car to keep up with me. It got to within 10 feet of catching up with us several times, but no matter how fast I drove, it stayed close behind. I remember looking at the speedometer and seeing that I was going 60 and the speed limit was only 45. It didn't seem like I was going that fast, but the fact that it had stayed right up on me like that tells me that these things can run faster than I thought. I don't think it really wanted to catch me, though. 
I think it was just playing with me at this point because I had seen what it could really do. As if it knew what I was thinking, it quickly looked at me in my car through the back window and gave a smirk, with all of its teeth showing, and then it barked loudly. It then turned around and ran into the woods, off to my right. And just as it did, I watched as hundreds of birds came flying out of those woods. A huge flock covered the sky as they up and left the area. That was a really strange sight to see, especially at that time of day, which made it obvious to me that they were feeling threatened too. It made me wonder if that thing was settling into one of their trees for the night, but I really have no idea if dogmen sleep in trees. I slowed down, but I continued to drive as I watched all of this transpire. And then once I was safely past, I looked in my back window and saw nothing but darkness. That's when I sped up to get the hell out of there. When I got on the main road to go home, I could tell that the others had done the same. At least, that's what I hoped because I didn't see their car anywhere. I never did get to actually talk with those college kids that stopped, and I often think about them trying to figure out who they were because I want to get in touch with them. I mean, I think they were in college. That was their age. They had college logos on their shirts. Anyway, I can only hope that they, or someone who knows them, is listening to this. I hope we can get connected, somehow. I'm not sure if this is the proper place to tell this story, but I'm hoping that someone can shed some light on this. It happened just a few months ago. I live in Nevada, and my backyard borders a small forest and a river. So I was sitting on my back porch one night, and I was looking up at the stars and admiring a full moon. I was always trying to get a little peace and quiet because I have two dogs, and they're always barking at something. But this night, they were quiet, and I was enjoying the silence. I was looking up at the moon when I saw this bright light in the sky was moving in a straight line, but slow enough that I could follow it. It wasn't moving too fast, not too slow. It was just moving at this consistent pace. And it was about the size of a dime if I were to hold one up and compare. The light was a bright white, and I could clearly see it. I looked at it for about a minute as I wondered what it was. At that point, I wasn't thinking it was anything suspicious, and it looked like it just might be a drone or something. But the thing that was weird right off the bat was that it was moving in a very straight line, almost a purposeful line, not up and down, just moving straight. I continued to watch it, and then after a bit, it started to change direction. I watched as it made a very abrupt 90-degree turn and then started moving in that different direction. I watched it for about two more minutes, and then it just disappeared. I was still trying to figure out what it was when the dogs started barking like crazy. They were over at the edge of where I cut, and they were barking at something in the forest behind the house. They usually bark at deer, raccoon, anything basically. But this time, they were barking at something that they were clearly scared of. I went out to see if I could figure out what it was. So I walked over towards them, and I looked. I looked in the direction that they were fixated on, and I saw bright white light off a bit in the distance. It was hovering above the ground from what I could tell. It was the same brightness as that light that I had seen in the sky. I watched it for a few minutes and then I decided to move in and get closer. That's when I saw a shadow figure move across the light. It moved in a jerky motion and I couldn't clearly see what it was. I watched it for a few minutes and then the light got brighter and I saw that figure again. This time I could clearly see what it was. It was a human figure, but on the small side, about five feet tall and very thin. It had a small head and skinny arms and legs. I could clearly see a face and it had big black eyes, a small nose, small mouth, and it was gray in color, but it was so dark that I couldn't tell if there were any clothes on it or not. I watched it for a few minutes and then it and the light started to move moved to the left, then moved up, was climbing up into the sky. It stopped about a hundred feet in the air, and then everything disappeared. I stood there for a few minutes trying to figure out what had just happened. I decided to go back inside, thinking that maybe I had just seen a ghost or something. I don't know what I saw, but I've never seen anything like it before. I have no idea what it could have been. 
I later found out that a friend of mine had seen something similar a few months earlier. He had been out in his backyard and had seen a bright light in the sky. Same story. He watched it for a few minutes and then it came down to the ground and he saw a human figure standing in the light. He watched it for a few minutes and then it disappeared. I have no idea what we saw, but I know that it was something similar. I'm not sure if they're connected or not. Obviously they must be, but I have no idea what is going on. I know I'll never forget. I'm just glad that I wasn't alone when it happened, but I am glad that somebody else saw the similar thing that I did. In case it had actually been a ghost, at least I knew I didn't just imagine it. Anyway, I'm still trying to find out what it was that I saw that night.